Our scripture reading this morning is from Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. Please stand with me in honor of God's word as we read this passage. Hebrews 4, beginning there in verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. May the Lord be blessed by the reading and hearing of his word. You may be seated. Help in time of need. That is our title this morning, and that is what this passage speaks of. Help in time of need. Let's begin with prayer. Father, we come to you, and we pray now because we want our hearts to be prepared to hear from your word. We recognize, Father, that it is your word that changes lives. It is your word that transforms us as your Holy Spirit applies it to us. Father, it is our desire that as Christians we would be accurate and faithful representations of Jesus Christ. And so today, Father, I ask that your word would change us. I ask that my speech and my language would be to your honor and glory, that it would be guided and directed by the Holy Spirit, that I would speak with passion and boldness and clarity the truth of your word. We thank you, we praise you for what you have for us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Perfect timing. We use this phrase often, right? If I walk into the house just as Jess was about to text me, oh, perfect timing. If someone brings us something just as we were about to ask for it, oh, perfect timing. The other day I was watching a video of these acrobats on a trapeze and I watched them fly across the empty space and one would catch the other and I cheered for their perfect timing. Magicians who perform sleight of hand tricks, athletes who perform feats of daring and awesome displays of, of ability, all of these things can cause us to marvel at their timing. Has anyone else ever noticed that God has perfect timing? You see, he sends what we need when we need it. Many times he sends help when we don't even know we need help. He does this consistently and he does this faithfully. And like the trapeze artist flying through the air, he catches us every time. And yet so often when I have a need, I get fearful. I doubt his ability. If you're like me, then you could say this same thing with me. God has never let me down. God has never let me down. He has never failed me. His timing in my life has always been perfect, and yet I doubt. The cure for doubt is faith. But faith is anchored in reality. And so today we consider three realities that will silence our doubts and calm our fears. Why? Because when we walk by faith, the storms of life will not sink us. So three realities today. The reality number one, our purpose, our purpose in enduring witness. Our purpose in enduring witness. Read with me Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Seeing then that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our confession. If you were to read the book of Hebrews, start in chapter 1 and read the whole way through, you would learn very quickly that Jesus is our high priest. And this verse gives us an action to take as a result of that truth. Because Jesus is our high priest, we are called to live differently. And there's three important points here in this verse that anchor our call to walk differently. The first is that we have a great high priest. He says, seeing then, or because we have this great high priest, Jesus the Son of God. So, 
uh, and he says that he has passed through the heavens. So, first, we have a great high priest. Second, he is in heaven. And third, he is the Son of God. Based on these points, we are called to hold fast our confession. That is what we are called to do. Now, let's look at these words for just a second. Hold fast our confession. Hold fast is the Greek word krateo, and it means to seize or arrest, to hold, adhere, to remain firmly committed to. Okay? So it's this idea of holding on to something, to seize it, to arrest it. Confession is the Greek word homologia. Confession, profession, an open avowal of some belief or opinion. So what is he saying? When you put these two words together, we're called to remain firmly committed to our stated belief in Christ. We're to hold on to our confession of Christ, our belief in Christ. We hold fast our confession. So this is what we have been called to do, to hold fast our confession. Now we ask the important question, why are we called to hold fast our confession. Why are we called to hold fast our confession? Now, you might be wondering, what's the point of this question? Here's, here's why we're asking this. The need to hold fast to something does not exist without opposition. Okay? Let me explain what I mean with an illustration. Let's say that we are hiking, uh, we're on a trip, we're hiking, and suddenly I trip, I fall, and I start to slide over the edge of the cliff. And as I'm going over the edge of the cliff, I reach out my hand and I grab onto a small tree, and it stops my fall. Now you're hiking with me, and you rush over and you're yelling, hold on, hold on. You yell, hold on, because gravity is going to try to pull me down, right? If there was no gravity, there would be no reason to say, hold on, because <laughs> I wouldn't have fallen in the first place. Here's the, the point that we're making. If no force is trying to pry us away from our confession of Christ, there would be no reason to call us to hold fast. Does that make sense? Okay. If nothing's trying to get us to not hold fast our confession, there'd be no reason to command us to hold it fast. The point is, there are things in this life that are trying to draw us away from Christ. And so the author of C. Hebrews says, hold fast, cling to your stated belief in Christ. We endure, we hold fast, because we are facing opposition. Now, who is opposing us? Now, I'm not looking for you to provide a list of names, right? Oh, let me tell you who's all holding me up from following Christ, right? Not what we're going for. We need to be aware of the opposition we face. Every child of God faces two forms of opposition, okay? There's two forms of opposition. What are they? External and internal. We face external opposition, opposition from outside, and we face internal opposition, opposition from inside of us. Let's kind of expand these and look at what are we saying? What does this mean to have external and internal opposition? Externally, we face pressure from a world system that denies Christ and wants nothing more than to move us away from Him. How do we know this? 1 John 2, 16. For all that is in the world... Now, let me just pause for a second. This word all is really important because it means all. All that is in the world. Now, does he, is he talking about the dirt and the rocks and the sticks? No, he's talking about the world system, society as a whole, right? Unsaved, unregenerate society, this is what it does. All that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. This world system wants to move us away from Christ. We also learn from Scripture that this world system, society by and large, is ruled, is uh, energized by Satan himself. Scripture reveals that he's in charge during this time in history. 1 John 5, 19. We know that we are of God, and the whole world lies under the sway of the wicked one. So this is the opposition that we face. Externally, we face opposition from a world system that is under control of the devil. Now that statement makes some of us uncomfortable. We don't like to think about the fact 
that Satan is the one energizing this world. We don't want to sound like those crazy Christians, right, who, are, who see Satan behind every curtain. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is this is what the Word of God teaches. Our world system as a whole is energized by Satan himself. And if we are drawn into that, we are going to be drawn away from Christ. One of the saddest verses in Scripture, in my opinion, is when Paul says, Demas has forsaken me, having loved this present world. What was Paul saying? He was saying that Demas got sucked into a love of the society of that time. And that society of that time caused him to be turned away from following Christ. We don't want to be guilty of that. We face this external pressure from a world system that is opposed to Christianity, and we need to fight against that. So that is externally, right? We're facing this opposition from Satan and the world that is energized by him. Now, internal opposition arises from our own sin nature. The child of God has been given a new nature. We are new creatures in Christ. Let's look at a couple of passages that deal with this. First of all, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Most of you uh, may have guessed that I was going there. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. All things have become new. We are new creatures in Christ. Our responsibility, then, is to walk in this new nature. Ephesians 4, 22 to 24. So 2 Corinthians tells us we have a new nature. Ephesians addresses walking in that. He says, verse 22, Ephesians 4, 22, that you put off concerning your former conduct, the old man, which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that you put on the new man, which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. This passage reveals two very important truths to us. What are they? First is this. We have an old and new nature. The picture is like having an old coat and a new coat, okay? Keep that picture in mind. We're going to come back to it. You have an old coat and you have a new coat. So that's the first truth. We have an old and a new nature. Secondly, we have the choice which nature rules our lives. So you have two coats. You have an old coat and a new one. Are you ready for an earth-shattering revelation? The coat that you will wear is the one you put on. Make sense? The coat you will wear is the one you put on. The same thing is true of our old and new nature. Paul says, put off the old nature. Take off that old coat. Set it aside. And then he says, be renewed in the spirit of your mind. We do that through the word of God. And then he says, put on the new nature. Put on the new coat. The coat that you put on is the one that you're wearing. Okay? So, which nature are we going to live in? That's the choice that we have. Which coat are we going to put on? Are we going to be the new man, created in righteousness and true holiness? Or the old man, corrupt according to deceitful lusts. Our old man, our sin nature, is alive and well and continually fights against us. Look at Galatians 5, 17. For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. There is a battle going on inside of the believer. Our new nature, as we said, created in Christ Jesus after righteousness and true holiness, is at war with our sinful old nature that is corrupt according to deceitful desires. Added to that is our own self-doubt and our shame that comes when we refuse to believe who we are in Christ. We refuse to accept who Christ has made us. So, we face internal and external opposition as we seek to be dedicated followers of Christ. Now, why are we covering all this? Because the author of Hebrews said we need to hold fast our confession. Why do we have to hold it fast? Because there is opposition to that. 
Our response to opposition is to hold fast our confession. We endure with a clear and faithful testimony of Christ. This is our purpose. We need to have an enduring witness uh, to the faithfulness of Christ. We cannot have an enduring witness without a proper focus. And that's why the author of Hebrews reminds us of who we serve. Remember, in the verse, he says, Who is this Jesus? Right? He's our great high priest who is passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God. Because of who he is, we hold fast our confession. We endure because we have a high priest. We endure because Jesus, the Son of God, ever lives to make intercession for us. We endure because our Savior is going to return for us. Our lesson in this point is this. My ability to endure trials depends on Christ. Would you read that with me, please? My ability to endure trials depends on Christ. Because of who He is, we endure we look at our world around us and we see the times that we're in. We see what is uh, persecution in so many countries and we see the beginnings of that even here in the United States. We have to be rem reminded that this is not unexpected. Okay, Paul reminded Timothy that times were going to be tough. 2 Timothy 3. He reminded him that people were going to want nothing to do with truth. Also in 2 Timothy 3. He warned him to expect suffering, trials, and opposition. Again, 2 Timothy 3. Read the passage. It's very uh, applicable to what we're going through. And yet, endurance is possible. This is very important, and I want to emphasize this point here. We are never commanded to do what we are not enabled to do. God never gives us a command to do something when he doesn't also give us the ability to do what he has commanded. The very fact that here in Hebrews we're told to hold fast our confession means that it's possible to hold fast our confession. Yes, times are tough. Yes, persecution is growing. Yes, trials are going to come. So what? The God of eternity is on our side. Two verses that emphasize this. Psalm 62, verse 7. In God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. This is such a good reminder because the author, the psalmist here, does not say, in my strength is my salvation. Nor does he say, in political power is my salvation. In God is my salvation. And my glory, the rock of my strength, and my refuge is in God. He covers all the bases here. Salvation, glory, the rock, right? What's going to keep us firm through all of this? And my refuge. What's going to keep us safe? God. Psalm 91, verse 2. I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress. My God, in Him I will trust. Our high priest, according to Hebrews is seated in the heaven. He's the Son of God, and He gives us the ability to endure. He will deliver. He will return. We have nothing to fear. Our purpose is to endure the trials of life and point people to Him. And we see that here. So that's reality number one, our purpose, right? And that is to be this enduring witness, to have this enduring Witness. That's reality number one. Reality number two. Our problem in indwelling weakness. Our problem in indwelling weakness. Look at verse 15. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. The author of Hebrews here is anticipating our objection, right? Well, you say that we need to hold fast our confession, but don't you know what we're like? Well, yes, he does. We have a high priest who is familiar with our weakness. We're our, we've already mentioned our ability to endure is dependent on Christ. Because of who he is, we are able to stand against temptation and proclaim the grace and glory of Jesus. He is our high priest. According to this verse, he sympathizes with our weaknesses. What does that mean? 
Sympathize is the Greek word sympatheo, and it means to sympathize. Okay, we get that. It means to share the feelings of and understand the sentiments, right? To share the feelings and understand the sentiments. By taking on human flesh, Jesus Christ was able to share in our feelings and understand our sentiments. He knows what it is to be tested. He knows what it is to face opposition. He understands what we face. Now, Jesus did not have a sin nature. Therefore, when he faced temptation, he did not sin. This word tempted is the Greek word perezo, and it means to test, to put to the test, to tempt, to be tested. To put to the test in order to ascertain the nature of someone. Okay? So, the temptations we face are a test. Right? They're designed to expose our imperfections and our faults so that we know what we need to work on. We need to make this point. Temptation isn't sin. What we do with temptation is. Being tempted doesn't mean you've automatically sinned. It's what you do when you're tempted. Right? If we give in to temptation, that is the sin. Now, if you're tempting yourself, right, by putting yourself in the way of temptation, that's a different issue. All right. We have access to the only one who has ever faced temptation and never sinned. He knows our weakness. He knows our struggle. Now, we might be tempted to say, well, if, if he was sinless, right, how could he really understand what we were going through? Zane Hodges uh, gives us a really important reminder in his commentary. He says this, it may indeed be argued, and has been, that only one who fully resists temptation can know the extent of its force. The sinless nature of Christ actually makes him better able to understand temptation. How can that be? Thomas Constable gives this illustration. He says, as an illustration of the thoroughness of Jesus' temptations, imagine a large boulder on the sea coast. Since it does not move, it experiences the full force of every wave that beats against it. Smaller pebbles that the wave moves around do not because they yield to the force of the waves. Similarly, Jesus' temptations were greater than ours because he never yielded to them. Likewise, a prize fighter, Jesus, who defeats the champion, Satan, endures more punishment than other contenders who throw in the towel or are knocked out before the end of the fight. Christ experienced the full weight of temptation. He never gave in. He endured. With him holding us up, endurance is possible. And yet, to endure, we must face the temptation. Right? Just, he doesn't say, hold fast to your confession, and it's going to be easy street. Right? He says, hold fast to your confession, because we're going to face opposition to that. As we saw earlier, we all have a sin nature, and it battles against us. Go with me to Romans 7, where this battle is depicted. Romans 7, 18 to 25. Romans chapter 7, verses 18 to 25. <clears throat> Romans 7, beginning there in verse 18. For I know that is in me, that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am! Who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then with the flesh, I, or with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. Paul clearly depicts here this battle that rages inside of us all. We have a sin nature, and that sin nature desires to lead us away from Christ. But we also have a new nature, and that new nature desires to conform us to Christ. And so they battle, and they fight, and they war. What do we do? The only solution is Jesus. He is the only one who offers deliverance. I love the verse here. He says, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? 
I thank my God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. So we have a problem. We have a sin nature that is waging war against us. Then Hebrews 12.1 adds another element to our problem. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Not only do we have a sin nature, but each and every one of us has certain things, certain sins that more easily ensnare us than others. Anger, gossip, lying, lust, gluttony, unthankfulness, whatever it might be, there's a particular area of struggle that each of us has. We are weak. We face temptation. We sin. Now, I don't bring this up to give you an excuse, right? Neither does the author of Hebrews. He's not saying, oh, well, that's just my besetting sin. Oh, well, that's just the one that easily ensnares me. No, these are written so that we can identify the problem and do something about it. Right? The saying goes, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. Right? If we know our area of weakness, if we know our area of struggle, we can prepare to fight against it. We need to take the steps to guard our hearts. And so, here's our lesson for this point. Dealing with our indwelling weakness requires decisive action. Dealing with our indwelling weakness requires decisive action. Why do we say this? Because... The sin that besets us, the temptation we face, is not going to go away on its own. Okay? Uh, actually, would you read this one with me? Dealing with our indwelling weakness requires decisive action. So it's not going to go away on its own. We can't ignore it and hope for the best. That will not work. <laughs> we must seek deliverance. So, reality number one, we have a purpose. Our purpose is to have this enduring witness, to hold fast our confession. Reality number two, we have a problem. We have this indwelling weakness. And that brings us to reality number three, our provision and eternal willingness. Our provision and eternal willingness. Look at verse 16. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. This is a verse that is often kind of pulled out of these other ones and we, we quote it on its own. But I think it has so much more weight when we look at it in its context because these verses that we've looked at build on each other. We're called to hold fast our confession. Then we're reminded that Jesus knows our weaknesses because we know that in our own strength there's no way that we're going to hold fast our confession. Now we're told Come to the throne of grace when you are in need. And so, as we seek to be faithful witnesses of Jesus, we're going to face opposition. That's what's going to happen. Some of that opposition is going to take the form of temptation. No matter what opposition we face, we're going to need help. Mercy, grace, and help are available. But to access those... Right? We have to come. This is the first step. When we are in need, we must come to the throne of grace. Right? That's what he says. If, if you're facing this, come boldly before the throne of grace, that you might find mercy and grace to help in time of need. So when we are in need, we have to come to the throne of grace. All the help we could ever desire is available to those who ask. The only reason we don't experience that grace and mercy to help in time of need is because we don't come to Jesus. 1 Peter 5, 6 and 7 says this, Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. If you want God to carry your burden, you have to bring it to him. Right? This is casting your care on him. He's not going to take it from you. You have to give it to him. That is why the, the, Peter starts here with humbling ourselves under the mighty hand of God. We have to humble ourselves and then cast our care on him because he cares for us. When in need, come to Jesus. So he says, come boldly before the throne of grace. 
So first we come to the throne of grace. And then he says, come with boldness. Come boldly before the throne of grace. This word has the idea of coming before God with courage and confidence. Courage and confidence. How are we, guilty sinners, able to come before a righteous and holy God with courage and confidence? Because of Jesus, right? Our great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus the Son of God. Ephesians 2.13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Hebrews 10.19 says, Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus. This is how we are able to approach a righteous and holy God. How can we come boldly before the throne of grace? The blood of Jesus. We come with courage and confidence because His blood has cleansed us from all sins. Colossians says He's taken them out of the way, nailing them to His cross. As we seek to hold fast our confession, as we face trial and hardship, as temptation strikes, we come before the throne of grace. We come seeking. We cannot obtain mercy and find grace and help if we're not seeking it. These words are in the active voice. So when it says uh, to come boldly before the throne of grace, the, it's active, right? They're active, meaning that we do something. <laughs> the mercy and grace are available, but only if we actively seek them. All of this demands that we acknowledge two things, two acknowledgments here. First, we have to recognize our need. Second, we have to recognize God's ability. Let's look at these in a little more detail. We have to recognize our need. What is it that we need? We need the mercy and grace of God. We need it when we sin. We need it when we are tempted. We need it when we face opposition. This mercy and grace is ours when we come to the throne of grace seeking it. As we look at the world around us, we can definitely see a need for mercy and grace. So that is the first step. We have to recognize our need. This goes back to what Peter said. We have to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. It takes humility to recognize, I can't do this on my own. I need the mercy and grace of God to help me. And that's where the second acknowledgement comes in. God is the only one able to provide mercy and grace to help in our time of need. So why do we come to Him? Why do we come boldly before the throne of grace? Because that's the only place that we can find the mercy and the grace to help that we need. Psalm 60 verse 11 says this, Give us help from trouble, for the help of man is useless. Give us help from trouble, for the help of man is useless. This same phrase is found again in Psalm 108 verse 12. Give us help from trouble, for the help of man is useless. So often, we come to the throne of grace only after we have exhausted all human resources. Folks, we have got to make Christ our first refuge and not our last resort. He needs to be our first refuge, not our last resort. Why? Because He's the only one who has the grace and mercy to help us in our time of need. When we have need, we come to the throne of grace. This is the invitation that we have from God. When faced by opposition, come. When temptation strikes, come. When burdened, come. When mired in sin, come. When broken, hurting, and alone, come. Come to the throne of grace. Obtain mercy Find this grace, oh beloved, come to Jesus. God is willing to provide mercy and grace. He is willing to help. So we are to come boldly before the throne of grace that we may find mercy and grace to help in our time of need. That's how this verse ends. We have this mercy and grace to help in time of need. And this phrase, in time of need, translates one Greek word. 
This one Greek word is eukairos, and it means well-timed, suitable, opportune. Suitable or at a time that is advantageous for a particular purpose. What's the idea? The idea is at the exact right time, the very second we ask for it, God sends his mercy and grace to help us. Psalm 46 verse 1 says, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. I love this idea, a very present help in trouble. Earlier we mentioned the idea of falling off a cliff and grabbing onto a small tree. If we don't grab onto the source of help, we fall. God is a refuge. He provides strength. He is our help in trouble. But if we don't come to Him seeking refuge, seeking strength and help in our time of need, we're going to fall. If you're falling today, reach out to Jesus. God's timing is always perfect. When we come boldly before the throne, mercy and grace are made available to us. Warren Wearsby writes this, No trial is too great, no temptation is too strong, but that Jesus Christ can give us the mercy and grace that we need when we need it. I love that. There is never going to come a moment in your life, in my life, when we are going to encounter something that is too difficult for God. But there will come moments, all the time, where we encounter things that are too difficult for us. And that is when we go to Him. We come boldly, with courage and confidence, to the throne of grace. Why? Because we need mercy and we need grace in our time of need. And that is only found at the feet of Jesus. He is our great high priest. He has passed through the heavens. He is Jesus, the Son of God. He is at the throne, interceding for us. All the grace, all the strength, all the mercy, all the help we need is available if we come seeking it. This is our provision. God is always willing to help when we are in need. Our lesson here is that mercy, grace, and help are given when we ask. Mercy, grace, and help are given when we ask. Would you read that with me, please? Mercy, grace, and help are given when we ask. But you have to ask. So will we come to Him with our need? As we wrap this up, we remind ourselves we have a purpose. Our purpose is to reflect Christ. It is to hold fast this confession. It is only possible to reflect Christ as we depend on Him. So that is our purpose. But then we noted that we have a problem. As we work towards this goal of reflecting Christ, our sin nature fights against us. As we run to Jesus, we face opposition. Some of that opposition comes from inside, some comes from outside, but the sin nature can only be overcome as we submit to Christ and we live in the new man. Which coat are you going to wear? Put on the new man. We have a purpose to hold fast our confession. We have a problem. We have this indwelling weakness, but we have a provision. Only as we seek the mercy and grace he offers will we find help in our time of need. We need to depend on him, submit to him. We come to the throne of grace and find mercy and grace to help. In light of what we have learned today, what commitment will you make? On a personal level, how will you and I depend on the Lord? Maybe we want to commit to spending more time in prayer. Maybe we want to commit to spending more time in the Word. You decide. In our relationships, are we lifting our friends and family members up to the Lord? We need to pray specifically. This requires two things. If we're going to pray specifically for those we have a relationship with, we need to first know their need, and that means we have to be willing to share our needs with one another. We can't know what isn't shared. 
We want to pray specifically for one another. It means we need to have conversations, sharing what's going on in our lives, and then we need to actually do it. Pray. Parenting. We need grace and mercy to parent well. Amen? Any other parents realize that this last week, maybe this last hour, maybe just this morning, right? We need mercy and grace to parent well. We find everything we need at the throne of grace. Pray for your children. Pray specifically for your children. But then also pray, we need to pray for our response to our children. Right? In our marriages, can our spouse see Christ in us? Are we bringing our spouse to Jesus? Not saying, okay Lord, here's all the problems that you need to change. But are we bringing them to Him and saying, Father, how can I be the best husband or wife? to the spouse that you have given me. So I want to take just a moment to invite you to write down a commitment today. As always, it doesn't have to be something that I've said. I want it to be what the Lord has laid on your heart to commit to today. We are salt and light. Scripture says that. We are ambassadors for Christ. And so we must hold fast our confession. The only way that we can maintain a good testimony in this world is through dependence on Christ. But to depend on Christ, we must bring every burden, care, and trial to the throne of grace. So we can only have a good testimony if we're depending on Christ. We can only depend on Christ if we're bringing everything to Him. Again, He needs to be our uh, not our last resort. He needs to be our first refuge. Mercy and grace to help in time of need is found at the feet of Jesus. I should have put only found at the feet of Jesus. This is the only place that we're going to find what we need. So, here's the challenges. Number one, depend on Christ. How do we do that? Through time spent in prayer, through being in His Word, through actively bringing all of our cares and burdens and concerns to the throne of grace and finding Him more than sufficient to carry our burdens. Depend on Christ. Secondly, display Christ. As we depend on Him, may He be evident in our lives. Display Him. Show Him off in your life through the way that you live. So, this is what we need to know. Our every need is met in Him. Our needs are not met in ourselves. Our needs are not met in our own abilities. Our needs are not met in other people. Our needs are met in Him. Let's pray. Father, I thank You so much for these three reminders. That we have a purpose. Our purpose is to hold fast our confession. But we know that we have a problem, and that is that we are sinful people. Yes, we have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. We are saints of His, but we struggle with this sin nature. But the solution to that problem is your provision of the mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. And so I pray, Father, that we would take our cares, our burdens, our fears, our sins, we would lay them at the feet of Jesus. Allow Him to carry them because that is the only way we are going to have the grace and the mercy in our time of need. I ask, Father, that this week everything we do, everything we say, and everything we think would bring praise and honor and glory to You and Your name. And I ask, Father, that we would display Christ this week, that He would be clearly seen in our lives. We thank you and we praise you for what you have planned for us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.